Good afternoon and welcome to everything you ever wanted to know about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This afternoon, Mike Calhoun, President of the Center for Responsible Lending, is going to talk briefly about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and specifically why it's needed, key components, what it does and doesn't do, why it's critical for the country, next steps on the bill. He will spend most of the time taking your questions, which you can submit any time through the chat function. And now I'd like to introduce Mike Calhoun. Thank you and welcome everyone to this afternoon's presentation and question and answer period on the proposal to establish a new Consumer Financial Protection Agency or Bureau. Um, the Center for Responsible Lending is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and advocacy group that works to help families build and protect uh, family assets and wealth, and we work to prevent abusive lending practices. Uh, we are an affiliate of one of the nation's largest community development lenders, Self Help, which has provided over $5 billion of credit to more than 60,000 families and small businesses across the country. And so we have to comply with all the provisions that we uh, propose and support. Um, and that, I think, often gives us a, a moderate view on many of these proposals. This afternoon, I'm going to quickly go through the basics of the proposal and the pending legislation in the Senate. And I will uh, first talk about the development, some of the key ones that led to the proposal, but spend most of the time talking about specific issues and provisions in the bill. And I will highlight three particular areas because they are the ones that have been subject to the greatest discussion and the most negotiation and proposed amendments uh, in the House and then also now here in the Senate. Those three areas are first, the independence or oversight of the financial bureau or agency. Um, that is how much authority it has to enact rules and to enforce them. Second, the particulars of that exam and enforcement authority. If it issues a rule, how does it go about making sure that the rule is followed? And then third, preemption provisions, which address to what extent the national banks have to comply with state consumer protection laws um, and the interplay of those with the rules of the Consumer Financial Protection Agency. So first, how we got to this point, um, the crazy patchwork quilt structure of consumer protection in federal statutes and agencies was brought to the front in this recent financial crisis. Presently, there are more than 17 different federal consumer financial prote protection laws, and the responsibility for rulemaking and enforcement of those laws is scattered across more than a half dozen different federal agencies. Uh, so, for example, the Federal Reserve has a primary role, but also the Office of Comptroller of the Currency that regulates banks, the uh, Office of Thrift Supervision, which regulates savings and loans, the FDIC, which handles uh, the insurance, um, deposit insurance, but also regulates a lot of state banks, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, HUD, and other agencies all had significant responsibility for various parts of consumer financial protection, but most important, consumer protection was not a primary responsibility at any of those agencies. So, for example, the Fed, everyone agrees, its focus should be our monetary policy, interest rates, and to some extent its role in preventing systemic risk. Consumer protection is way down the list there. Um, and so as a result, you found consumer protection often was ignored, and often there were conflicts as well. For example, the regulatory agencies, 
were uh, under pressure from banks to encourage some activities that may have been uh, detrimental to consumers and ultimately they turned out to be detrimental for the overall economy but in the short run they were very profitable and subprime lending is is an example of that people got into subprime lending because it was extremely profitable up until 2006 and in that regard the Federal Reserve in 1994 was given the responsibility and the authority to monitor and prohibit abusive mortgage practices throughout the entire industry. So they and they alone had the authority to set rules in place that would have prevented a lot of these crazy liar loans and uh, exploding arm loans. And those rules would have applied to all lenders, state chartered lenders, uh, national banks, anyone engaged uh, in any significant level of mortgage lending. The challenge was that the Federal Reserve, uh, particularly during the leadership of Chairman Greenspan, was op opposed philosophically to providing that type of regulation of mortgage products. He thought that the market would totally self-regulate and that there wouldn't be any problems. He has since uh, stated that he was in error uh, and that uh, the market did not do a good job and needs uh, a referee to provide fair rules to make sure that it's a fair game. So let me shift to then what the CFPA or CFPB proposal in the Senate would do. Um, it first and primarily consolidates responsibility for all of these various statutes. And if you go through the bill, you will see that one of the largest sections of the title on, on consumer financial protection is simply transferring rulemaking authority under these uh, 17 different statutes to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Bureau uh, is set up by Chairman Dodd's bill that was reported out of committee establishes a bureau within the Federal Reserve as opposed to in the House bill that came out of the House had a standalone independent agency. And so for comparison, uh, the House version would make the Consumer Financial Protection Agency more akin to EPA or even the Federal Trade Commission, whereas the Senate version makes it more like uh, the OCC, the Office of Control of Currency, which regulates uh, national banks. The OCC is a division within the Treasury Department, though it enjoys a great deal of independence within that uh, agency. Um, and that comes to the first main issue that's being debated and has been the largest source probably of uh, discussion on the bill, and that is where it should be housed and what type of, of authority should it have. Um, the call for an independent agency, a standalone agency, we believe is the best way to establish the necessary independence. And one way to look at this is it would seem odd, for example, using the analogy of the Environmental Protection Agency to have it situated as a division of the Department of Commerce. Um, no one would have uh, seriously, I think, proposed that these days. That being said, the structure that the bill coming out of committee has has a lot of protections to provide independence within the Federal Reserve and in our view the placement of the agency at the Federal Reserve uh, is, while not the first choice, is not uh, fatal to having an effective consumer protection uh, enforcer and regulator uh, being established. Key though is that the agency have independent funding uh, because if you can control the budget you can control the work uh, 
And the it, one advantage actually of being at the Fed is the, the funding could come through the Federal Reserve, which is not dependent each year on individual appropriations. And those appropriations have historically uh, provided a vehicle for lots of riders that limited, for example, HUD when it tried to place limits on activities of mortgage brokers, they were thwarted by budget riders. And the same with the Federal Trade Commission when it tried to take various actions on consumer um, problems that had developed. The other aspects of the independence that are addressed in the Dodd Bill, uh, it is a director appointed by the President, confirmed by the Senate. We believe that it needs to be an individual director to have the stature and gravitas to successfully deal with other principals who are involved in financial regulation, such as the comptroller of the currency uh, or the Secretary of Treasury. Um, a real key issue has come up, and this has been raised uh, largely uh, or most vocally by uh, ranking member Shelby is the possibility of conflicts between safety and soundness of the banks and consumer protections. We believe that the lessons of this financial crisis have shown that uh, primarily those two goals are mutually reinforcing rather than being conflicting as we found that if loans are not sustainable for consumers Ultimately, they're not sustainable for banks or for the larger economy. It's noteworthy that a number of existing regulators have testified at numerous hearings that they do not foresee any significant conflict between safety and soundness concerns and the consumer protections that might be promulgated by the new Consumer Protection Agency or Bureau. Nonetheless, the bill that came out of Senate Banking has a provision that provides that a panel of regulators can veto any regulation of the Consumer Protection Bureau if they find that it, in fact, presents a threat to safety and soundness. We are concerned about this and believe that there should be no veto power for the banks and the bank regulators. And a recent uh, event gives us concern about that. When the Federal Reserve adopted credit card rules, and these are the mildest version that preceded the legislation that passed the House and the Senate overwhelmingly, the comptroller of the currency filed a comment opposing those rules, arguing on safety and soundness grounds that they would jeopardize the solvency of the credit card banks. Well, I think we've all seen uh, that we don't need to worry about the solvency of the credit card banks, and even they acknowledge that they can quite well live under the new rules while they're cha changing some of their practices and certainly have raised some fees. Uh, none of them find and all of them, I believe, have publicly stated, and I have personally heard them at various uh, committees, meetings, state that they can live quite well under the new credit card rules. But it's an example where a prudential regulator of the type on this oversight board that the Dodd Bill would create uh, overreacts and protects the very short-term profits uh, at the expense of long-term sustainability. So we have urged that the oversight provision be deleted from the current Dodd Bill that came out of committee. And on the other side, Senator Shelby and others have proposed that the oversight board have even more authority to overturn rules. Right now, under the Dodd proposal, it requires a finding that it presents substantial safety and soundness threats and requires a two-thirds vote of the oversight board 
to block any of the consumer protection regulations that are proposed. Uh, Senator Shelby has proposed at various times to either, and the same with Senator Corker, to make that either a majority vote or to turn either the Federal Reserve Board itself or another proposal had the FDIC, the OCC, uh, and the Consumer Protection Board make up a three-person panel uh, that would, a majority vote would overturn any rule. And this is uh, unprecedented in terms of other agencies. Uh, again, the Commerce Department does not give veto power over the Environmental Protection Agency. All rules of all the agencies are subject to review under the Administrative Procedures Act, and the CFPB uh, is required by the House version and the Senate version to consider safety and soundness issues and to specifically respond to them in writing in its rulemaking process. And we believe those protections are sufficient without the need for an oversight board and particularly without the need for an even stronger uh, uh, oversight board that is largely existing bank regulators. The next major issue that has come up is the authority of the CFPB to examine various financial services providers and to bring enforcement actions against them. Uh, and it falls into three main groups of lenders under the bill. First, the bill sets up a uh, category of large, very large banks, which are defined as banks with over $50 billion of assets. And while that is a small number of banks, those banks have 80% of the banking assets in this country right now, which reflects the large amount of consolidation that's happened in the banking industry over the last 10 years. For those banks, the agency under the House and Senate version would have authority to um, examine and to enforce the regulations. The exams would require to be coordinated with the prudential regulator, that is the OCC or its successor. Um, the next category of lenders are banks uh, uh, of less than that. Excuse me, that's a 10 billion, not a 50 billion. I'm mixing up two provisions. So it's banks with assets over 10 billion and banks of assets below 10 billion. Uh, for, exam for examination authority of banks under 10 billion, the House version allows a backup examination authority. The uh, Senate version has uh, much less. Essentially, those are left to the existing uh, regulators uh, to enforce the CFPB uh, uh, rules. The third group of lenders are the non-banks. The House version gave exam and enforcement authority of for those, with some exceptions, which I'll address the key ones. The Senate version provides that there is exam and enforcement authority over larger non-bank lenders, including all mortgage lenders. And for the smaller lenders, it's uh, very limited enforcement and exam authority, particularly exam authority, with the agency by regulation determining where the demarcation line is between the small and large lenders. As I indicated, there are some exceptions. Uh, the most notable of those is the House excluded auto dealers from all exam enforcement and rulemaking of the CFPA. The Senate bill that was reported out of committee does not contain that exception, and the consumer groups, uh, civil rights and labor groups strongly have opposed that exception. 
as well as the Department of Defense issued a letter asking that auto lenders not be excluded from the rules of the CFPB as auto lending uh, abuses have caused significant problems for service members. And again, this is a point I think to remind ourselves that if done right, the rules should benefit both consumers and responsible lenders. One of the things we saw in the market and one of the things uh, CRL experienced directly through its affiliate is that when there are no referees on the field, the most unscrupulous practices prevail. And so, for example, we saw our mortgage lending, which our loans are all 30-year fixed rate, fully documented loans, no prepayment penalties, low fees, that our demand for those loans dried up as other lenders came out with deceptive products that had teaser rates with low payments that then exploded a year later that had lots of hidden fees, prepayment penalties. And we saw that over and over again as the bad credit products drove the good credit credit problems out of the market and penalize both consumers and responsible lenders. A final issue regarding the exam and enforcement is a key provision in the House and the current Senate bill is that it allows state attorney generals to enforce the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's uh, rules against all lenders. This is particularly important because neither of the bills add any additional private rights of action. And this becomes most important in the area of unfair and deceptive lending practices. So for those practices, if an individual gets a loan that violated a CFPB unfair lending regulation, they would not have the right to go to court and enforce that rule themselves. They would be dependent upon the agency, the CFPB, and state attorney generals. And there has been some push to try and remove that authority for state attorney generals to be able to enforce the bill. A final area of the bill that has received uh, discussion is how the bill addresses the issue of preemption. Under current law, national banks are subject to some but not all state laws uh, regarding lending. As noted by the Supreme Court, most state laws like contract laws, employment laws, debt collection laws, foreclosure laws apply to banks and vary from state to state. For example, the foreclosure laws right now, there have been some publicity about the fact that they vary noticeably uh, among the different states. Um, during the last 10 years, the banking agencies greatly expanded the scope of laws that were preempted, meaning state laws that were passed that applied to lending and the federal banking agencies, most notably the OCC, by letter and by order and by regulations, ruled that national banks did not have to comply with them. And one of the most notable areas was mortgage lending, where, the, for example, the Office of Comptroller of the Currency ruled that national banks did not have to comply with state predatory lending law that limited abusive mortgage terms. The House bill rolled back those preemption rulings to where they were before the most recent expansion by the agencies of their preemption in 2003-2004 and uses as the standard that put forward by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1996 in a case called Barnett Bank. And the Senate bill follows that as well. 
there were some proposals in the various negotiations to completely strip all preemption provisions from the current bill, which would leave the preemption in its very expansive scope that we have today. And there have been a number of studies that have shown that institutions with greater preemption and states who lost uh, laws to preemption suffered more predatory lending and greater foreclosures. Those, uh, again, are the main areas where you will see uh, issues discussed. So just go through them again. What's the level of independence and oversight of the CFPB? What are the rules for exam and enforcement? Uh, who, who can the CFPB enforce its rules against? Are there groups carved out of the bill entirely? And the one that has been most vocal have been the auto dealers and our state attorney generals allowed to enforce the uh, provisions of the CFPB. And then finally, again, the last and third major group of issues are under the preemption uh, rules. So in summary, the CFPB is designed to provide more protections, but more choice for consumers. Uh, you, there was some attention given early on to what was called a plain vanilla provision that was in the initial administration proposal, but was removed from the House uh, bill that, that was passed. And that would have required lenders to offer certain so-called plain vanilla products. Um, there was concern that that might restrict choice too much, and so it is not part of the bill in either the House or the Senate. The bill also tries to provide and does for more efficiency by having unified rulemaking and enforcement. So for example, there's been a good bit of publicity over the last year that HUD issued a requirement for a new so-called good faith estimate to be issued in connection with mortgage loans. And that was inconsistent with a number of requirements that the Federal Reserve imposed under the Truth in Lending Law, which it has authority for. In fact, there have been various legislative attempts to slow down the implementation of the new HUD rule, uh, although it did go into effect this year. And it really makes no sense to have these conflicting disclosures out there. This bill specifically addressed that conflict, and by consolidating all the authority with the CFPB, would prevent such future conflicts. And finally, it's designed to provide a level, fair playing field. One of the things that we saw in the financial crisis was that too often there were areas of financial services that were unregulated. And if a lender chose simply to have a different type of charter, it could evade effective regulation. The bill tries to take a functional approach and regulates based on the nature of the product, not the type of charter that the institution providing the product or service has, and not the label that might be placed on the product. So at this point, we will shift to the question and answer period, and want to make sure that we have enough time to handle any questions that people have. So Dave? Thank you, Mike. And we have a few questions that have already been submitted, so let's start with those. First of all, won't the CFPB penalize the banks that actually did the right thing? Well, I think two things. First of all, remember the CFPB uh, is, is headed by an administrator appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So that in and of itself provides a lot of checks uh, on uh, the type of administrator that will head up the CFPB. It then has to go through detailed rulemaking, complying with both substantive and procedural standards. And those rules are subject to review in court by 
either other agencies or industry players. For example, just as EPA rules can be challenged in court if they're unreasonable or exceed statutory authority. But most important, the, the main lesson of the financial crisis has been that responsible lenders are uh, severely hurt by the absence of fair rules, that they were out trying to offer sustainable products and they were competing against people who didn't have to play by the rules. It, it's much like uh, if uh, we just finished the final four, if one team got to foul and the other uh, did not, uh, you, the, the better basketball team is probably not helped by a game with no referees uh, and no fouls at all called. It quickly degenerates uh, into a free-for-all, and we saw the financial equivalent of that, particularly in the mortgage area, over the last 10 years. So there's every reason to believe that this will result that CFPB would result in more consumer protection, but with more uh, protection for responsible lenders who don't have to compete against other companies that don't play by the rules. Okay, and another question that's been submitted. Won't the CFPB create more bureaucracy? Can't this be done within the existing structure? Uh, as noted before, I think if, if you were starting from scratch with no consumer protections on the books, it seems that the simpler structure is to have a single agency rather than scattering consumer protection across all the different agencies uh, that have it today. And in fact, is what the, the bill would do is actually transfer staff from these different agencies, consolidate them in a single agency, which should provide additional efficiencies, and most important, provide level, uh, even coverage of financial services providers and financial products, and hopefully uh, clear, less duplicati duplicative and conflicting regulation. Okay, another question. What do you think the likelihood is that Democrats and Republicans can come up with a bipartisan bill that actually prevents another crisis? The Consumer Protection Division, is, first of all, I do believe there will be uh, a bipartisan bill that passes uh, the Senate and is enacted, and, and I base that on the public statements of a number of uh, senators from both uh, parties. I think everyone recognizes, one, the, the public policy need for that. Uh, virtually every regulator has said that we need to do a better job both of consumer protection and of systemic risk and just general regulatory review. The system we had was mainly uh, an anachronism. For example, you had separate regulators for national banks and national savings banks, but they were functionally identical. And in fact, they competed with each other, the regulators, for the, uh, to, to attract institutions to be regulated by them since they were funded by assessments of those regulators. And one of the most notable examples we saw was a countrywide bank was regulated by the OCC and thought the OCC was imposing too many protections, so it switched its charter and became uh, a thrift and went to the Office of Thrift Supervision, even though it didn't change its products or its services at all, except that it now was subject to less regulation. The other, the consumer protection provides for sustainable lending, which is critical for preventing another financial crisis. The, there are uh, many other titles in the bill, the systemic risks, the provisions for resolution of uh, failing institutions that address that. I don't think they can guarantee, and there have been a number of public statements that they can't guarantee uh, 
that there won't be another financial crisis. They greatly, though, would reduce the risk of such a crisis and the frequency of them and the severity of them because uh, that, that is what's most noticeable about this last crisis was not that it, that, that it occurred. There have been various versions of financial crisis happening almost every decade uh, for a considerable period. You had long-term capital back in the 90s. You had the savings and loans uh, in the 80s. Uh, but this one dwarfed almost everything else, and we are much more susceptible to these large financial crises given both the consolidation of banking and financial services. Now uh, most of the market, as indicated, is dominated by a handful of big players, and also uh, computerized training and exotic financial products have created much more volatility in the market where when things start moving in a direction such as we saw with the downgrading of the subprime mortgages, it starts a cascading sequence of events that subject the whole financial market and whole financial system to stress. Uh, so I, I think there is consensus that the bill will move us in the right direction on systemic risk. There are debates about uh, how best to structure the resolution authority. Do you rely primarily on a version of bankruptcy versus uh, resolution by, for example, the FDIC? Do you have a resolution fund that is funded in advance by assessments on banks? Or do you uh, rely on taxpayers fronting that money if a crisis occurred and then trying to recoup it from financial institutions? So there are a number of key issues out there about how you address it. And another one would be derivatives, the so-called credit default swaps and other derivatives. Uh, the bill attempts to bring those onto regulated exchanges. And the key issues are uh, what exceptions are there to that provision. So the other titles address that even more so than the consumer protection. But the bill as a whole will clearly improve the financial regulatory system and and reduce the threat severity of future financial crisis. Can you say more about why state laws need to stay in place? Won't CFPB be sufficient? Um, the state laws are important for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, oftentimes uh, a problem develops on a local basis. So for example, uh, in this last crisis, Ohio was one of the first states hit with the problems of subprime loans, the foreclosure crisis, and the problem with foreclosure rescue scams. Uh, if states can't take any actions on those, one, it can't address those problems until it becomes a national problem. And then second, under our federalist system, uh, the states are meant to be laboratories of experiments of what works best. And we saw that happen with state uh, predatory mortgage lending laws. And the Tenth Amendment and our Constitution delegate to states authority, and the Supreme Court decisions state that even national banks uh, largely operate under a dual set of laws, federal and uh, state laws. Um, so the, you know, there has been, I think most importantly, there, there have not been problems to date with states uh, overly restricting financial products. Again, state legislators are very close to uh, their voters, uh, probably more so than Congress. And if they adopt troublesome provisions, they hear about it quickly. So the, the reasons to believe that, strong reasons to believe that preemption went too far. And I would point out the provisions in the Senate bill and in the House bill still 
exempt national banks from most direct regulation of credit. They, in fact, the House bill and the Senate bill, for example, specifically say states don't get to set interest rates for national banks. So credit cards, uh, mortgages, etc., are offered by national banks. The states can't set a maximum usury or interest rate on those. And so there, there's this idea that the states under the House bill will be allowed to adopt anything. And in fact, uh, if, if the main criticism of the House and Senate version now is that they still allow way too much preemption of state law. No one thought that we were having great problems in, for example, the 1990s uh, with national banks having to comply with too many state laws. If the consumer protection regulators clash with the safety and soundness regulators, who wins? Under the, uh, under the current Dodd bill, the uh, prudential regulator could raise safety and soundness concerns and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau would be required to address those concerns in writing in the rulemaking process. Um, if the CFPB uh, proceeded with a rule that a regulator or industry thought was illegal, either of them could challenge that in court through the Administrative Procedures Act. In addition, the current Senate bill provides for a oversight board that would have a uh, final authority to veto any consumer protection rule on the basis that it found that it presented a safety and soundness concern. So you have multiple layers of protection, and in fact we believe too many layers uh, 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 protection uh, for resolution of that conflict. Uh, for example, the OCC, the, the prudential regulators are not subject to that same kind of review of their regulations and whether their regulations present consumer protection uh, problems. Uh, so it, it's already very one-sided in the current Dodd bill. Will the CFPB only approve plain vanilla products? Uh, as I noted earlier, the original administration proposal that came uh, from it and in Treasury had a provision that authorized the uh, Consumer Financial Agency or Bureau to require lenders to offer uh, so-called plain vanilla products and the most often cited example is in the area of mortgages where uh, lenders might be required to offer a 30-year fixed rate mortgage to compare to the other products that they offered. Uh, borrowers would not be required to take the plain vanilla. Only lenders would have been required to offer it as one of the unlimited options that they could uh, provide to the borrower. That arose out of the concern that what we saw in this last housing crisis is that it was not accidental that consumers ended up in these exotic mortgage products. The mortgage brokers and other mortgage originators or lenders got paid much higher fees, often two or three times as much, to put the same borrower into an exotic mortgage, for example, an option arm loan, uh, these ones that are, are having the highest of the def uh, foreclosures, as opposed to putting them in a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And many borrowers, as we now know, would have been better served by the 30-year fixed rate mortgage and were never even presented that option through the broker or lender they chose. The 
that provision on plain vanilla products, even uh, though it did not require people to take a plain vanilla or preclude other products in a, any other way, was stricken in the House version and is also not in the Senate version. So there explicitly is uh, the, the CFPB is prohibited from even requiring that plain vanilla products be offered, much less that they be the only financial product that's offered. So that is, will not be a concern under this legislation. Is this agency all that's needed to make sure we don't end up in this kind of financial crisis again? Quickly, as we discussed earlier, this is one of uh, many titles in this provision. And I would urge you to make sure to look at the other titles as well. Um, some of those are, while the Consumer Protection Agency has been the most visible of the titles in this bill, there are other critical provisions in this bill uh, that are, are more complex in many ways and less in the public eye. So, for example, one of the most critical is the so-called uh, the regulation of derivatives, uh, the ones that most famously brought down AIG, it traded in so-called shadow markets, uh, these credit default swaps, these guarantees, there have been other exotic financial instruments, and unlike stocks, uh, they are not traded on any established exchange, and so even today, Regulators do not know with any reasonable estimate the amount of credit default swaps that are outstanding, much less who issued them. Um, so, for example, this has caused products problems not only for the stability of the financial market, but for uh, businesses and for farms. Uh, that, the, as all of us experience, the uh, wild swings in gasoline prices and oil prices due to speculation in the price of oil and the lack of regulation of that market make it difficult for farmers to lock in prices and plan and get financing to, uh, to, to, to engage in their business. And for that reason, uh, a substantial group of so-called end users, people who buy these kinds of protections, uh, have come out in favor of reform that requires these derivatives and swaps to be traded on exchanges so that they can be regulated, that there is an open market where pricing and competition work better. Other areas are uh, preventing the too big to fail by giving regulators the authority to limit leverage uh, that, for example, for the investment banks like Lehman Brothers got up to 30 to 1, meaning for uh, every uh, $100 of assets and, and securities they bought, they only had a little over $3 of capital, which meant that if those securities went down by more than 3%, they were broke. Um, there are other critical provisions there as well to prevent the stacking of leverage and overextension of credit that pushed our financial services industry, our financial markets, and the whole economy to the edge of depression. So this consumer financial protection is critical for this, but is by no means the only component of the financial reform bill. I've heard that Senator Shelby has floated a possible bill. What do you think of that bill? There are a number of aspects of it. Uh, I think most notably, and this is the reason for optimism that a bipartisan bill will be reached and passed by a substantial margin, is that Senator Shelby and uh, Senator Dodd agree on the vast majority of the issues in financial reform. Uh, the most public area where they disagree has been the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, where it should be housed, and 
most importantly, what oversight there should be of the agency in terms of can the bank regulators veto its proposed regulations, and then some disagreement on the enforcement authority with Senator Shelby wanting to leave more of it to existing bank supervisors. Um, but they have agreed in, on a lot of areas of role of the Federal Reserve, for example, in regulating the largest of the bank holding companies um, and a lot of the other regulatory reforms. The uh, elimination of the Office of Thrift Supervision is pretty much agreed to by everyone so that that would be merged into a new uh, OCC under a different name. Um, protections against uh, at least study and protection against so-called proprietary trading, which is insured banks engaging in stock trading for speculation, not on behalf of their clients, uh, the so-called Volcker rule there, that historically that was not allowed until recent years. Um, and then the other provisions there. So there is more agreement on a lot of the less public issues, there's still some significant disputes, um, but I feel confident that there will be ultimately agreement in, or at least compromise on all those issues, including the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm not seeing any more questions at this point. So Mike, I guess we can wrap up at this point. Well, thank you again for joining our uh, webinar this afternoon, and again, the Center for Responsible Lending, we're at uh, www.responsiblelending, all one word, .org. Feel free to uh, go to our website for additional materials on this issue and also uh, to contact us at either our Durham, North Carolina or Washington, D.C. Uh, offices. Thank you and good afternoon.